Raypack, part of the Ream family of companies. As a reminder to all of our participants, the instruction provided in this training is intended for qualified and experienced professionals. If you are not qualified, please do not attempt to apply these instructions on your own. Welcome to part three in a series of web-based presentations on the MVB and external appliances. In this section, we will cover both the LCD and touchscreen user interface of the boiler, all of the Versa and PIM dip switches, and then some startup and preventative maintenance tips. High efficiency is important to Raypack to meet our sustainability goals in support of a cleaner planet. The Xtherm delivers high efficiency with two heat exchangers and a 7 to 1 turndown ratio. This high efficiency, combined with a low NOx combustion system, is good for both the environment and your fuel bills. First up, we will discuss the current and older user interface systems. All current MVB and Xtherms use a capacitive touchscreen to control the boiler, but that was not always the case. The touchscreen came into play in 2013. Models built prior to that used the LCD. Since a well taken care of boiler can last 10 to 15 years, there's a bunch of the LCD models still out there. This table is just a reference to what was built and when. There are five top level menus in the Versa system. The older MVB and Xtherm models will have LCD displays, and the newer and current ones will be touchscreen. If the boiler has an LCD interface or a touchscreen, it does not matter. They both access the same system. It's analogous to using a keyboard or a mouse to operate a computer. This is the view menu. On the LCD, you can scroll through the five top level menus by pushing the menu button. Once on the menu, you want to push the item button to scroll through the items in that menu section. On the touchscreen, it's kind of self-explanatory. This is the next menu in the system. On the LCD, it's called Setup, while on the touchscreen, it's called Adjust. The items listed on the LCD menu are in the submenus of the touchscreen. Like stated before, both the LCD controlled boilers and the touchscreen controlled boilers are driving the same software. Of course, we made updates and improvements along the way, but the primary functionality is the same. This is the boiler menu you would access for boiler status and critical operating data. All of the items listed on the LCD menu are in the submenus of the touchscreen. Just push the boiler button and lots of data will be shown. The electronic on off switch for the boiler is found here. Don't forget to turn it on. The monitor menu on the LCD has performance data for the boiler. On the touchscreen, this is a subset under the view menu. Select master view from the view menu. From the toolbox menu on the LCD, you can run a user test, see the software version, restore defaults, and see the fault code history. The boiler fault history is on the boiler menu for the touchscreen version. There are touchscreen tools on this menu that you would not need on the LCD, like screen reboot and brightness. On early edition touchscreens, sometimes the changes that were made would not stick. Doing a screen reboot can correct that. It's like rebooting your computer. Next up, we will define all of the Versa dip switches. The Versa board is located in the junction box behind the front panel. There are eight dip switches on the Versa board and they're easily accessible at the bottom of the board. These are the eight, eight dip switches. We will discuss each of them in the following slides. Dip switch number one is a limit switch for the access level. This comes in handy when there is the potential for untrained hands working on the equipment. When the access level is limited, a lock icon will show on some of the screens. Turn dip switch number one on to regain full menu access. Dip switch number two tells the boiler if it is a master or a follower. When there is only one boiler, it is always a master. In cascade systems, there can be only one master. Always use 18 gauge stranded copper wire for cascade communications. Only use non-shielded cable. You can now connect up to seven followers to the master. Use the shortest possible run, not to exceed 200 feet. The first three followers connect from the follower PIM to the master versa, 
on the FT bus. As stated, always use 18 gauge stranded non-shielded wire for these connections. With the new software, four additional follower PIMs can be connected to the master PIM. These four additional followers will be called follower 5, 6, 7, and 8. They will wire up PIM to PIM in daisy chain fashion. This connection is called the TN bus. Tip switch number three turns on the cold water protection options. This family of boilers requires a minimum inlet temperature of 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The Xtherm has cold water protection as standard. These menu items become available with the Versa dip switch number three activated. The function of each will be discussed next. With dip switch number three on, this menu will be available in the adjustment section. This is where you make changes to your cold water protection settings. Mix type describes the type of cold water protection that is present. If it is a three-way valve like depicted here, then the mix type is valve. If an injection pump is used, like on our external models, then the mix type is pump. If there are multiple boilers in the cascade and the cold water protection is a three-way valve down by the decoupler, then the mix type is plant. Mix target is the minimum level the boiler can take. The lowest this can be set to is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. If the mix target is not met in seven minutes, the boiler can either alarm and keep running or alarm and shut off. The mix lock setting determines this action. Mix speed is used for defining the rate of response of the cold water protection system. Generally, medium is best. Mix inverse is used to define which way the spring actuator works for the three-way valve used on the cold water protection. Different manufacturers set them up differently. If the actuator responds with a 0% to 100% open with a 0 to 10 volt DC signal, then the mix inverse is set to off. If the actuator responds with a 0% to 100% open with a 10 to 0 volt DC signal, then the mix inverse is set to on. Mix trim allows for a final fine tuning of the cold water protection system. Scaled from minus five to plus five, this allows you to give the system a little nudge one way or the other if necessary. Some three-way valves need a 0 to 20 milliamp signal instead of a 0 to 10 volt DC signal. If the valve selected needs a milliamp signal, then turn on dip switch number four. A 500 ohm resistor will be required. Dip switch number five is not used. Dip switch number six will be discussed shortly. Dip switch number seven is used on indirect pool heaters that are part of our X-Therm fam family. Dip switch number eight is not used. Dip switch number six controls heater rotation. This is some cool Raypack technology. When in cascade, turn on dip switch number six on the master boiler. After 48 hours of burner runtime and the current call for heat satisfied, the next boiler in the cascade with the least amount of burner hours will fire on the next call for heat. Now say you have a boiler that's running in perfect harmony with the building and the boiler is just modulating up and down as needed, but never shutting off. We have a solution for that too. At 60 hours of continuous burner runtime, the boiler will go to target plus differential, putting an extra shot of heat into the system and then shut off. At that point, the next boiler in the cascade will fire up as above. Next up, we will discuss the PIM dip switches. The PIM dip switches are in that little recessed box on the platform ignition module, commonly called the PIM. This is easily accessible in the junction box behind the front panel. These are the eight dip switches for the PIM. We will discuss each of them in the next few slides. A handy thing to remember is in most cases, without a building management system, the typical setting for the PIM dip switches are number three, four, and seven on all others off. PIM dip switch number one gives the operator the option of defining the temperature differential or to allow the Versa program to determine the best differential for the system. Auto differential is always recommended here. The Versa program will optimize based upon the system inputs to the best differential temperature to avoid short cycling. When it is necessary to run at a very high temperature that threatens tripping the upper limit, 
You can use a manual differential setting ranging from 2 to 42 degrees Fahrenheit, split evenly above and below the target. Dip switch number 2 only comes into play when PIM dip switch number 5 is on. If number 5 is off, PIM dip switch number 2 does nothing. If PIM dip switch number 2 and number 5 are on, then the boiler will be looking for a volt DC signal from an external controller like an energy management system for direct drive function. With dip switch number 2 off and number 5 on, the boiler will run to target temperature. This only applies to single boiler systems. Firing rate control from an external system will not work in Cascade. A Temp Tracker Plus is an example of an outside driver that could be used here with dip switch number 2 on. Dip switch number 3 controls the post purge option. Post purge allows the pumps and the cold water protection systems to run for a bit after the burner shuts off. This extra 20 seconds of pump runtime gets the residual heat out of the combustion area so you do not trip on a high limit accidentally. The default time is just 20 seconds, but it can be adjusted from 20 seconds to 20 minutes. PIM dip switch number 4 is an example of some helpful Raypack engineering. With PIM dip switch number 4 on, the boiler will cycle the pumps and cold water protection if present after a period of 72 hours of inactivity. So say you are in shoulder weather like spring or fall, and you get a week of warm weather where the boiler does not need to fire. You don't want the pump to seize up from inactivity, so this system helps to prevent that. After 72 hours, the pumps will run for just 10 seconds, just to keep things working properly. During these 10 seconds, the display will show exercise. PIM dip switch number 5 needs to be on to engage dip switches number 2 and number 6, as they all support energy management systems. When driving the boiler from an external controller like an energy management system, also known as a building management system, then turn on dip switch number 5. The energy management system will connect up to ports 13 and 14 on the low voltage panel. If not driving from an energy management system, leave dip switch number 5 off and the Versa system will drive the boiler. As just stated, dip switch number 6 only comes into play when dip switch number 5 is on. Here is where you select what kind of signal type is needed. On indicates a 4 to 20 milliamp signal, while off indicates a 0 to 10 volt DC signal. If not using an energy management system, leave dip switch number 6 on the PIM off. Dip switch number 7 is another example of some cool Raypack engineering. Turning on number 7 enables freeze protection for the boiler. It works like this. If the temperature drops below 45 degrees at either the inlet or the outlet sensor, then the boiler pump will run for a bit, drawing some heat from other areas in the system until the temperature is higher than 50 degrees at both sensors. If the temperature continues to drop, and gets below 38 degrees at either sensor, then the boiler will fire for a few minutes until both sensors are over 42 degrees Fahrenheit. This process will override a soft lockout, but not a hard lockout, as that would be dangerous. PIM dip switch number 8 controls the commission test. This is a handy tool for demonstrating that the high limit is working properly. With dip switch number 8 on, the boiler will run to 20 degrees Fahrenheit higher than the high limit to force the high limit shutdown. Once complete, power off the boiler, turn off dip switch number 8, and turn the boiler on to clear the fault. Next up, we will go over how to start up an MVB or external appliance. Generally speaking, on any boiler startup, it's good to know what you are working on. Read both the Boiler Installation and Operations Manual and also the Versa Manual. Make sure you understand what you have read. Use the wages approach. Are the water lines connected? Is the venting correct? Has the gas line been purged? Are the electrical connections correct according to the manual? Is there adequate room to work on the boiler? Make sure that the gas line is connected as per both the manual and the National Fuel Gas Code. That means there must be a drip leg or sediment trap present close to the boiler. Make sure there is a quality pressure regulator in place. 
Pressurize the line and check for leaks before you start it up. Verify the supply gas pressure at the bleedle port upstream from the gas valve. Make sure the pressure is within 4 to 10.5 inches of water column for natural gas appliances and 4 to 13 inches for propane. Once the boiler is fired up and at 100% fire rate, check the manifold gas pressure at the downstream bleedle port. Don't try to memorize the target values, just look them up in the manual. The manifold pressure will always be in negative units of water column because the gas is pulled from the valve by the blower. Here are the values for the external models. The bleedle port is in the same location, just downstream from the gas valve. It's a good idea to tighten the electrical lugs before the unit is energized. Sometimes things loosen up on a boiler as it makes its way across the country. Once energized, verify the voltage with a multi multimeter. If more than one volt AC is present on the common to ground, there will be electrical problems. The same rules apply for the externs as we just saw for the MVBs. Make sure the breaker is the right size, as per the manual. Once all the utilities are connected, it's time to start it up. The startup sequence is shown here. The first startup on a new heater might take a few tries to work all of the air out of the gas line. With the boiler fired up at 100%, it's time to check the air pressure. There's a T-port on the silicone hose that runs from the gas valve to the swirler. Be careful not to lose that black cap. It is very important to dial in the air and gas pressure settings before you go to use the combustion analyzer. If the air and gas pressure settings are way off, you may be producing too much CO2, and you can damage your combustion analyzer tool with a big hit from too much carbon dioxide. The maintenance section is next. The maintenance tables are also in the manual. Daily, check for good airflow in a clean environment. Do not store flammables near the boiler. Monthly, look for leaks and obvious signs of problems to come. Evaluate the condensate treatment kit, if so equipped. Annually, check the venting system for soot, leaks, and corrosion. Storing pool chemicals near a boiler will damage the internals of the boiler. Never store chemicals or flammables in the boiler room. The preventative maintenance schedule is similar to the suggested maintenance schedule. This list resulted from discussions with the RAPAC service team. The last bullet point refers to looking for any signs of burner degradation or discoloration. The HSI, flame sensor, air filter, and condensate trap should all be changed annually or more frequently if needed. The burners used on this line of appliances are made from an alloy called fecroloy. It's a made up word meaning iron, chromium, and aluminum. Since it has iron in it, it can rust. Therefore, never use water when cleaning the burners. First, use dry compressed air blowing from the outside in. Next, use a hydrocarbon solvent like brake clean. Make sure the burner is dry before reinstalling it and be extra careful when working with flammable solvents. The troubleshooting section is next. The MVB and external boilers have touchscreens on them since 2013. So troubleshooting is pretty straightforward. The older models prior to 2013 used an LCD interface, so you had to read the display to tell you what was going on. This table has the most common error codes and is available in the manual. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. This is the third and final presentation in a series on MVB and external boilers. Right back. Engineered to perform, built to last.